Afternoon, everybody. We're just going to give uh, our waiting room a chance to join, but we'll probably make a fairly swift start because we know how precious everybody's time is. So we're very grateful to have you all here and very grateful for our speakers and panelists um, who've joined us. Um, just a quick um, couple of points of housekeeping. Um, Please do introduce yourself in the chat, uh, say where you are, tell us what you're working on, tell us the scale of the projects that you're involved in. We're really keen to get a sense of where everybody's at today. Um, and just a general point, uh, the event today, it's, it's supposed to be quite interactive and collaborative. So please do um, get involved when it comes to the breakout sessions. We're gonna run through the, the order of the day now in just a minute, but so yes, the welcome um everybody um lynn can you pass oh no i've got slide access hang on not used to having control of the deck um so we today are having this um what we've called it is our passive house social housing procurement and access to contractors round table so we've arrived here today because earlier this year in january following about six months of engagement um, with local authorities, mainly in London, but then that stretched out across the country a little around passive house, social housing, and where were the areas that more sort of support and knowledge share were, were needed. Um, the event that we held in January was really, really well attended. We had almost 600 signups, which just shows this great um, desire for more knowledge and, um, and support when it comes to all things passive house which is wonderful but the key takeaways from that event were more support around costs the case the business case for passive house and ultimately uh, procurement and access to contractors so we've got the series of roundtable events and the first one here today is, is around uh, procurement and access to contractors so this is what we intend to kick start today we will have some Brief uh, panel presentations from Emma Davies, Matt Bridgestock and Emma Osmondson. I'm sure all of you will be really familiar um, with our um, expert uh, panel presentations. Then we've got a quick Q&A panel discussion for about 15, 20 minutes. And Jacob Wilson from Be First is also going to join us for that. So you can start thinking about some of your questions, but I'm sure there'll be things to respond to in the presentations as well. Then we're going to get into the breakout room discussions and this is where all the magic happens so in those breakout rooms we'll also have a mirror board for everybody to work into you'll have a facilitator who will be going around the room and asking each of you to tell us a little bit about your issues and troubles and um um uh round procurement but also a big focus on we had the potential to release some of those issues what would that look like what would the solutions look like and then we'll take some priorities from those um, breakout sessions and feed them back to the room so anything like this is only as good as uh, anybody who's participating so please do feel free to get involved in those breakout room sessions as much as possible use the sticky notes that are in there to record all your gems of wisdom and experience because that will be really really helpful and give us a great wealth of information we find that the feedback from participants is really the most useful thing from these sessions so I'm looking forward very much to that. Anyway, that I think is enough from me. So yeah, other than continuing to share who you are and what you're working on in the chat, I'm going to get straight into our um, panel presentations. So I'd like to welcome Emma Davies um, from Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. So Emma, uh, Mike is yours, but only for five minutes. <laughs> I, I will do my best. I think when I timed myself earlier, I was slightly under the five minutes. So um, yeah, thanks for inviting me along to this roundtable session. And I think for me, I'm coming at this procurement discussion from a slightly different angle. So for me, it's about looking at the benefits of procuring Passive House from the perspective of a local planning authority. So a first thought for me really is that when you're thinking about procuring Passive House, thinking about the deliverables and the role of Passive House in helping you to secure planning permission is definitely something to consider. So many local planning authorities at the moment for many of us responding to the climate emergency and securing high standards of performance is really high on the agenda. 
And there's an increasing number of local planning authorities at the moment who are looking to develop net zero carbon policies that are rooted in passive house and the metrics in passive house. So a lot of us are looking at introducing things like space heating demand requirements and energy use intensity requirements for new development. So by taking that step of procuring your projects to Passive House, you're already gonna be a really good way along the process of um, delivering those emerging policy requirements. And I think even in cases where local authorities don't have policies around net zero carbon, I've actually witnessed firsthand in planning committees the importance that is now being placed on Passive House certification by committee members. And in some cases, this has helped projects secure planning permission. So I think that's a first thought from me when you're thinking about kind of, do we go down this route of procuring to Passive House? A second really important consideration is the value that you can gain from the in-house performance that a scheme certified to Passive House will bring. So we all know about the performance gap between as designed and as built homes. And this is something that's been reported on. It feels like for donkey's years, ever since we had the kind of the zero carbon hub back in the days of the old zero carbon uh, definition. And it can be very considerable, the, um, the performance gap. But again, I think, you know, when you're procuring something, you really want to be sure that it can be delivered. And I think given the level of testing and evaluation that takes place as part of the certification process for Passive House, that really can help to eliminate that performance gap, which again is going to be really crucial for you in determining how successful a procurement process has actually been. And I'm, I'm definitely seeing an increasing number of schemes coming through the planning system that are now certifying to Passive House. It used to be only a handful of schemes a few years ago, and now we're seeing a huge uplift in the number of schemes that are certifying. And for me, when you're thinking about procurement, that really does show that there are lots of design teams out there and contractors who've got experience of designing and delivering to Passive House. So I would say definitely don't see that as a barrier to Passive House. I've also taken part in a few procurements uh, for our investment partnership recently that's the, who are now looking to deliver to Passive House. And again, when you're asking for these standards, we're finding that's not limiting the number of responses that you get to those procurements, either from those who were already experienced in delivering to Passive House, or as our investment partnership actually found, those that are willing to actually go on that journey with you and learn how to deliver to Passive House because they see it as a good business opportunity for them. And I think a final thought from me really and a common theme with all of the schemes that I'm seeing coming through the planning system is that a lot of the clients behind those schemes, they are really thinking about legacy and taking a really long term view of the success of their projects. Um, and I think those that are delivering these projects to Passive House, they really have a vested interest in the health and well-being of those who are going to be living in these new homes. They want to help alleviate the impacts of the cost of living crisis and help reduce fuel poverty amongst their tenants and those living in these new homes. And I think where you've got social housing schemes coming forward, they can see an added benefit in terms of helping to reduce rent arrears and that sort of thing. And I know that this is a topic for a future roundtable session, um, but I think for us, this is where whole life costing has been really, really useful. And it's something that our investment partnership used to help inform their decision to build to Passive House because they were able to actually look at um, a much kind of longer term idea of viability and costing, and they were able to take account of the cost to homeowners, as well as kind of the upfront um, building costs. So yeah, those are just a few thoughts from me, but I think, as I say, from my perspective, as someone who's working on planning applications and trying to ensure that new developments are delivering high quality, high environmental performance, for me, when I see Passive House, I, I can definitely, you know, breathe a slight sigh of relief really, and kind of go, right, okay, 
you know, I know that this is going to be a good scheme. So yeah, really interested to see how the discussion goes today and the kind of um, the breakout sessions as well. But yeah, that's it for me for now. Thank you, Emma. I think that's really great and also amazing timekeeping. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's really brilliant to just get that what's under what's underpinning all of that. You know, talking about um, the the closing the performance gap and underlying quality and all of those things and those being really really um, positively looked upon from a planning perspective. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll probably have plenty of questions for you. Um, in the panel, in the Q&A panel discussion, but I'd like to ask Matt, uh, Matt Bridgestock. Um, Matt, can you um, take the reins and let's hear from you for an equally snappy five minutes? Of course, uh, I will do my best. Oh, there we go. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm an architect. I'm based in Glasgow. I'm going to show you some pretty pictures, but also talk about procurement and contractors and all of those um, good things. Um, in the last eight years, we have done, uh, we are working on projects from a uh, single house all the way up to a um, hundred million pound um, uh, school project. Um, so uh, quite a wide variety of experience. And we've looked at quite a lot of different contracts. So this project in Glasgow, um, it's five passive house um, uh, homes in the tower, the new build tower, the retrofit wasn't passive house for various reasons, but as a traditional contract, um, we supported the contractor and there was a, um, a client side uh, architect to manage the uh, manage the contract. Um, the retrofit we've just uh, completed whilst not quite achieving the Enerfit air tightness standard um, was designed to put Enerfit and was um, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, uh, to almost to that standard, uh, but that was done under a, a standard traditional um, contract as well. Um, that's uh, the important thing with the control and all of the mechanisms around that. Um, that was with Southside Housing, and the contractor was on the framework. It's not, um, you know, it wasn't um, an unusual um, contracting or procurement process for them, and we brought them um, up to the standard that's needed. And then with working up in WIC which is um, north of Inverness, uh, for anyone who is not from Scotland, it's a long way away. Um, but uh, we're looking at two post-war houses. Again, we're looking at um, contractors uh, from the local area. We're bringing them up to, um, up to speed with um, the requirements that they need. And um, obviously the design is all there. Um, again, that's a traditional contract. And I think right through this, there's an interesting thing about Considering uh, through the procurement, and I'm going on to other things in a, a second, but considering the procurement, thinking of the balance of knowledge and the balance of expertise and trying to bring that up on both sides and not expecting it to be unbalanced when you look at it um, across the piece. So now we're on to um, design and build contracts. And again, these housing projects, um, we uh, worked through a framework with a contractor to develop um, a passive house offering through that framework so that um, there was cost certainty uh, for the client going into that, um, going into that project. And then we worked on a design and build basis with uh, an employer's agent. We had a, a number of employer's agents who sat on the client side um, and we uh, uh, worked with them to develop their expertise so that the whole team again was balanced across the piece. Um, we were providing most of that expertise, but we were passing it on to the client and the, the client side team in order to make sure that we all got the quality that we were looking for. Again, with Closeburn, this was for a development trust. And I think the interesting thing there was they are um, not uh, regular development clients. They don't do a lot of development. This is their first development. They may go on to do a second development, but um, that's as far as their aspiration goes. So again, that learning, spreading that across, making sure there was the right team, the right site team for that to speak to all the residents around about them. Uh, this is uh, Gaelock Head. This is 10 houses and flats, again, for a housing association, design and build. They're regular clients. They know what they want. They know what their design guide st says. Um, and uh, that was um, delivered through them, but using one of the employer's agents that had also worked on the other projects 
that I've previously talked about. So again, their knowledge came in and we then took some things that we learned from the previous projects and put them into this project. And we've just finished a project down in Lancaster, which is 20 houses and flats. Um, again, the issue there was it was design and build, but it was a contractor who hadn't done passive house before. So we had a team that had done passive house and understood it and had been taken through that process. And then it was about getting the contractor on board and, and skilling them up to, um, to bring them through the process. Uh, and then just on to a few bigger projects. These are management contracts. I'm not going to keep good time, sorry. Um, but uh, these are management contracts, uh, management, design and build. Interestingly, the, um, the bigger projects in many ways, and uh, this is a bad slide to, the swimming pool is a really complex thing. Let me go back to this. In many ways, they're quite a lot simpler, but there's a lot more people involved. And it's about communication. And so the procurement is not just... The procurement issue is not just around the actual contract, it's about the communication within the team. Um, swimming pools, a very complex project. We've been working on this for two and a half years, so the team are all really knowledgeable about Passive House and about all the other things. So we've brought them from zero to being really knowledgeable. And finally, Dundee, this is um, a massive project. The budget has actually gone up quite a lot since there actually i see the budgets on there but it's got quite a lot unfortunately but it's huge um and the issue here is about communication and uh and getting the right team and making sure that that expertise filters all the way down not just from director level senior management level but all the way through all the way down onto site all the way down all the subways i hope that's given you a taster there's probably a lot we can talk about in the breakout thank you very much Thanks, Matt. That's really interesting to see the breadth of projects that you're involved in. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that was setting off all sorts of um, questions for our um, participants. And I'm going to go straight to you, Emma, and you have control of the slides as well. So uh, over to you. Good afternoon. Great to see everyone. Um, so I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour, um, I guess, about some of our experience um, in Exeter. Uh, where I've uh, recently moved from Exeter to Waltham Forest. Um, my slides aren't wishing to work, but I can um, talk you my way through them. So what I wanted to touch upon this afternoon was um, A, to share with people the passive house journey we've taken in Exeter over the last 13 to 14 years, how we've gone from small beginnings of uh, two to three, um, affordable homes through to larger scale projects, including uh, the UK's first multi-residential passive house project back in 2010, and then um, the UK's first certified passive house extra care. And of course, most recently, uh, the UK's first passive house leisure centre, which, if it's any consolation to you, Matt, took us 11 years to deliver and not just two or three or four years. Um, so it sometimes really helps um, if you can put the time in. But I just wanted to touch on um, a little bit about um, kind of contractors and procurement routes um, and talk about. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would you do you have control of your slides? Because I think I might. So you could. Oh, just yeah. Me. Could you could you control? Yeah, I don't seem the buttons don't, don't seem to want to work for me today. Okay, so, well, just you say next slide when. And okay, I should do so that for you. if we just uh, you quickly fast forward through some of the uh, pretty pictures of what has been delivered across Exeter. So we'll just whiz through these, so just so people can just see uh, the scale of development and how we've grown with confidence and complexity. Um, so, um, and then once we've gone through the visuals, which will finish at St. Sidwell's Point, I just wanted to then share with you um, our experience of a contractor's framework. So the next slide is showing Exceed, uh, which was a contractor's framework that we set up in 2016. It had a four year duration um, and the intention was that it was a framework to service our pipeline of passive house projects that we were delivering across Exeter. Now, uh, the framework now has uh, reached the end of its lifespan, but I would be really keen, and perhaps this is something we could discuss in our breakout areas, whether or not there is an appetite for us to consider um, a framework or a series of frameworks 
to help with the ambitions of lots of um, local authority, public sector, housing association, and increasingly private clients now that want to take the passive house route. Our particular framework was let into four um, lot sizes. So it incorporated, you know, small retrofit projects through to those large capital multi-million pound uh, projects of over 10 million. And on the next slide, um, it just sets out um, how we attracted different contractors um, that then um, fell within the different lot sizes. Some contractors fell within all of them. But what we were seeking to do was to secure interest from SME contractors, um, as well as some larger and regional contractors, as well as national contractors. Um, so we um, had a good cross section. And then the next slide sets out really um, the kind of benefits of adopting a framework approach. Um, for us, it was very much looking at reducing our risk, having um, a pipeline of projects, but with a guaranteed sort of source of contractors that were uh, proved to be competent or perhaps had the right attitude to deliver them for us. Um, and that particular um, framework was open to all public sector and charitable organisations um, across the UK. And the next slide gives you just a quick overview of who that encompassed. And the next slide sets out really um, how the framework, um, uh, how the framework actually operated. Um, so we were really looking at testing and assuring that we had the both the technical capability and capacity. So those contractors that were, that were on the different lot sizes we knew um, could potentially deliver, um, that they had good financial standing and obviously they met all the very um, rigorous health and safety accreditation needs. And then the next side sort of sets out um, the process that um, we went through in order to secure the contractors for the different lot side sizes. It was a two-stage process. The first was a pre-qualification -qual uh, questionnaire, the PQQ. The second was then an invitation to tender. Um, and only those contractors that kind of passed the, the PQQ were then eligible to move into the second stage. The next slide then um, sets out um, the second stage where we were really looking at selecting contractors on a 70-30 quality cost weighting. So this slide gives you a summary of the quality weighting and how we apportioned scores. And then the following slide sets out how we apportioned um, the weighting towards cost. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview in terms of some reflections of that earlier um, framework. I think in many respects, it was ahead of its time. So there was a little or no take up outside Exeter City Council. So we were able to use it ourselves. And I hasten to add Richard Heyman is with us today um, from, from Exeter. So he'll be able to also feed into any discussions. However, there were some limitations. Firstly, even over the four year span of the framework, some contractors ceased trading. So actually we had a lesser choice of contractors um, as the framework matured. I think on reflection, the lot sizes were probably too wide and it probably precluded more SMEs. And increasingly we found SMEs are probably often better fitted for passive house projects. Um, and increasingly we're looking to uh, phase larger passive house projects into smaller phases to really tap into the SME's kind of attitude and agility to adopt to passive house. Um, what we did find was that by having a framework approach, it certainly accelerated the time frame. Uh, so accelerated the time frame in terms of we could deliver more quickly on site. So that was one of the key benefits. Um, on reflection, that 70-30 quality and cost, we thought we were being really quite cute in really emphasizing the importance of quality particularly that so so important with passive house but actually i think it reduced the competitiveness of people within the framework uh, because they obviously provided a lot of evidence from a quality perspective but then quite often their costs were still relatively high and then finally when we actually utilized the framework Unfortunately, some of the contractors did not live up to expectations. And I think that was reflected really because 
um, within contractors, there tends to be quite a lot of staff churn. So maybe individuals that were involved in getting onto the framework had moved on. And I think that was definitely one of the weaknesses that we picked up. So that's kind of everything from me. Um, but I just wanted to really share with you kind of what we've done in the past and to open up the discussion of looking at the potential maybe for another contract framework. And dare I may suggest also the consideration of maybe of a consultant's framework as well. So thank you. Thank you, Emma. I mean, you covered a huge amount of ground there and I um, appreciate you also setting in the minds of everybody here the idea of um, how we actually might put some of this into practice because this is where the round table idea sort of uh, originally started was this notion of well how could we go beyond just sort of signposting to contractors that are out there and actually how do we start to um, create the pipeline to start to almost generate the, um, the contractor um, pool from which we can um, access the project. So we're going to move quickly into a Q and a panel discussion. So I invite everybody to um, ask questions. You can um, raise your hand. You can put a question in the chat, um, you know, however you like to do that. I think um, I have a couple of questions um, myself. So I might just start with one, just feeding off what you last said, Emma, about um, being considering that the lot sizes lot sizes being too um, broad perhaps in the preparation of this round table we were discussing how best to bring people together to talk about um, the use of frameworks and how that might be supportive should we do that regionally should we do that based on lot sizes and it becomes quite a difficult thing to manage to understand lot size I mean that's partly why we're asking everybody you know what are you working on what scale of what projects have you got how can we best work out how to bring together that support so uh, your reflection on the lot sizes being too broad how might you reorganize that or how what what would you think would be a good next step in terms of identifying either lot sizes or regional frameworks sort of the the organization of this I think a lot about a lot of it is about having good understanding of what's in your pipeline um and I think often I'm going to be really open here uh, and say often we need kind of frameworks and procurement processes that kind of deliver the, the outcome that we want to achieve, i.e. I think often we find the right contractors and often you need to work backwards to find out well what's the right process to ensure that we get to work with this right partner. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is something about having a good understanding of what of the scale of everyone's pipeline the need to promote SMEs as well as regional and national contractors um, and also the, the purpose of having a framework that is going to really look at investing the expertise and the experience for the longevity so um, so I think for me, I'm, I'm a real champion for tapping into the SME marketplace, but I think it would be good, even if we open up a discussion amongst the group, as, for the scale of development, certainly the one-off bigger projects, if you've got leisure centres and the like, but often a lot of our projects are probably more small to medium-sized residential projects. Mm. Um, so it would be good to have an understanding and then perhaps to think about, well, if we were going to do it even on a regional basis, what would be the optimum lot sizes that would ensure that you've got enough interest and you've got enough competition? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to, thinking of the, the the lot sizes for a minute, I also just want to um, welcome Jacob Wilson to the um, panel. Jacob, you're here with us from B First in Barking and Dagenham. Um, so thank you for joining the panel discussion. I think that's what's in my mind. You could maybe tell everybody... Um, what Barking and Dagenham are working on in terms of Passive House. And then once you've done that, we've got a question from Paul um, in the room. So Paul, once Jacob has explained um, what Barking and Dagenham are, are working on, we'll come to your question. Sure, thanks, okay. Sarah. So, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm from, I'm from B First, and um, I think we're a lot earlier on in terms of what Emma was just describing in terms of Essex, uh, Exeter's Passive House 
um, program we're a lot earlier on so we're we're quite experienced in terms of uh, developing uh, we've got a lot a lot of large re, uh, residential or mixed use projects but we've only got our first passive house project on site um, we've started relatively small so it's eight uh, maisonettes and apartments uh, that's on site currently and we're working with Wilmot Dixon. I think important for our context uh, is that a lot of our projects are quite large. Um, B First is in Barking and Dagenham, it's a large growth area. So I think predominantly we work with the tier one contractors. And I think, again, it's quite interesting what Emma was saying about, does Passive House suit the SME type contractors better? I think traditionally, like that's what we found when talking to our tier one contractors about Passive House is, you know, are they are they geared up as some of the smaller ones potentially smaller overheads or more nimble i don't think so but hopefully it is maturing i also really liked uh what em was saying about you know could we split projects up into smaller parcels and therefore reduce the contract size so for context b first are working on contract sizes that are around 50 to 75 million and that's really determining um who we're working with um just to go to your question about you know framework lots and sizes um We've done a lot of work kind of reviewing our pipeline, and that's really determining who we're working with. So we're setting up a new framework at the moment. We've, we have frameworks for four-year periods. We've just closed off one. We're just kind of um, starting a new one. And Passive House will be part of that. It's not going to be a kind of a Passive House framework. I mean, I would love it to be there, but we're not there. Uh, I'd love it to be that, but we're not there as a client. And we have a number of other objectives, where it's just delivering a, a large number of affordable housing or kind of, you know, using MMC or lowering our embodied carbon or circular economy design. You know, we have a number of um, competing uh, demands that we are working through, and that really determines who we're working with. Um, but Passive House will be a part of that framework going forward. I mean, you've covered a, a lot of the bases there. There's just so much richness in, in what you've said and lots of opportunity. Matt, I'm going to bring you in um, just on that and then we'll come to Paul. I, I was just going to put in um, an ex the experience from Scotland is that the, and the SME have driven the uptake of Passive House initially, but um, there's been a change in the uh, funding requirements for large schools. And that means there's been a complete change in the tier one contractors. Now, most of them will say that they were already changing. So perhaps I'm being too harsh, but I would say that most of the tier one contractors that are working up here have got a good understanding of Passive House now, whereas I think maybe three to four years ago, it was a very niche, not you know, not big thing, whereas now it's completely changed. And uh, so I think uh, you know, if the funding the contractors follow the funding so if the funders and if you're the funder Jacob of oh, you know, then that you know the that experience comes quite quickly I think that's what I'm trying mm. to say yeah. yeah thanks Matt Paul would you like to unmute yourself I think you can yeah brilliant yeah thanks Sarah uh, yeah my question was predominantly for, for Emma but I think um, I'd welcome views from everyone Given your experience with the with the framework, Emma, how, how dynamic do you think once you've got experience of setting up a framework, you could make it in terms of more flexible um, timescales? And the, the sort of question comes from where other local authorities, but not in this field, perhaps on the retrofit or traditional procurement, have more dynamic frameworks now. And I just wondered whether that was obviously not for setting up new frameworks but for those with prior experience whether you thought that something could work or do you think that comes with some inherent problems um i think it it swings around about really um often i'll use framework dynamic frameworks because they're kind of so easy um but i think much depends on your appetite for risk um your accountability in terms of value for money and i think also much depends on your contract choice um, and it was interesting to see uh, Matt mentioned, you know, highlighted different contract choices in a lot of his projects. And I think um, we're much the same in terms of what, what we did in Exeter. You know, we went from traditional forms of contract through to design and build. And more recently, I know that Richard Heyman's um, using a construct and excellence contract. And now a lot of that really is shaped around our appetite for risk so you can see originally we went a standard form of contract because we felt that we probably had greater knowledge as a client than the contractors did then we moved into design and build because partly because our projects became more and more complex and larger in value 
uh, but also because we noticed that contractors were getting a little bit more experienced and they were less risk adverse to passive house. But I think in the current marketplace, um, I'm sure all of us are experiencing whether they're passive house projects or not. It's just hellishly expensive to get any projects on site and contractors aren't prepared to take any risk. And therefore, we've had to be really agile and look at a contract that shares the risk with um with the contractors so so i think you need to look at a framework that has got a degree of flexibility um, but ultimately you want a framework that secures the right people that you know have got the capability and the mindset and more importantly the attitude that they can be flexible in terms of their approach to risk um, but also they're in it for the long term so they they really value that investment in you know, even if they're quite new to passive house projects, but learning each and every time to get better and better and get those efficiencies. Thank you. I wonder, does anybody else um, on the panel want to come in on that? Because I think there was quite a lot around that before. There's one other question before maybe we'll move into the breakouts that I'm conscious of protecting people's diaries and time. Um, Matt? I, I was just going to echo what Emma said, and I think that the growing confidence, you know, the initially clients go for um, traditional contracts because, you know, for the very reason they've, they've got the expertise but growing confidence amongst um, contractors and growing expertise means that you can choose contracts for different reasons rather than just and and that but I think that balancing is really important and that's that to me is, all the way through has been uh, this thing you've got to you know, if the contractors come in now without the expertise then you've got to you can choose any contract, but you've got to make sure that they've got access to that expertise so that you don't get into a situation where you know the that risk and the cost the cost of them um, struggling uh, around passive house um, is passed to the client. so that's um, I think I think that's just a really important point and um, yeah. you know the exact wording of the contract to my yes. mind is is a little bit like health and safety. It doesn't matter which contract you're in now. It's, health and safety is paramount isn't it so um same with passive house yeah um emma davies can i just ask you i know that you've shared a link in the chat can you just speak a second to that and then there's another question <clears throat> yeah i just thought it might be worth seeing if there's any lessons that could also be learned from the refit framework which is local partnerships and is a framework for energy performance contracting um it's certainly one i know all of the Local authorities in Cambridgeshire have used that framework for procuring um, works to their own buildings to enhance their energy performance. So I was just sharing that really just to see if there is anything that could be learned from how that framework has operated. Um, it was certainly an interesting when I was involved in that procurement process. It was quite an interesting uh, process and again one where we did get a lot of information um, a lot of interest from the various contractors on that framework and I think it just it, it made it a slightly easier process for us because I think for a lot of local authorities with limited resources procurement can be quite a scary place so yeah yes it's, absolutely mm. absolutely um Jacob were you going to Say say something, or was that just you thinking? <laughs> yeah, just, just thinking. I mean, I'd, I'd probably echo a lot of what Emma said previously. Like we're we're similar contract types. Where we are trialing construction excellence type contracts, so collaborative forms of contract and, and testing how how they go. I think there's some really interesting work there. Um, there is a question in the chat, which I'll just ask Emma um, Osmondson to answer really, really briefly, and then we'll go. I think straight to the um, breakout rooms. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I was. I, was doing, I did half half the response. So um, I think yeah, the market's really shifted in the last fifteen years from us paying people to tender to people now lining up and knocking on the door saying, "Look, we want to do passive house. We want it on our CV. We see the commercial value of delivering passive house because the ward and his wife, you know, want passive house." Um, what I would say is though, this you know, it you know. The one thing we continually struggle from is the drain of passive house experience from contractors. So they'll go and deliver one project, 
you'll find that the individuals within the contracting firms are really motivated. They really want to go on to the next pacifiers project, but there isn't one because the pipeline isn't all lined up. Therefore, they disappear and that expertise just disappears with it. So I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of getting that continuity um, within contractors for that. Now, again, it would be good to question whether or not SME is a better place for that because do they hold on to staff longer? Or, you know, you do see what some of the, you know, national contractors now that are almost developing bespoke, you know, low carbon, zero carbon delivery teams. And it could well be that that's what will give them the advantage. Yeah, that's really, really helpful insight. Um, so I think what we're going to do now, just um, in terms of next steps of this session, um, we have got a mirror board and we're going to break into breakout sessions. We've just posted in the chat, there's the link for the mirror board. Um, really easy to use. Um, do shout if you're having trouble accessing it, let us know. Um, and we'll put you in breakout rooms. There'll be a facilitator in each breakout room. Um, we did need to control the invite list for today because we wanted to ensure that we could have breakout rooms where people felt they could speak to each other. And um, so our numbers are a little lower as with natural drop off from events. Um, so we'll have four breakout rooms, I think, what we is what we've um, ended up with just so that there's a good balance of people so we can all share and learn from each other. Uh, please do turn your video on in the breakout room so we can um, uh, have a discussion with each other and use the stickies. There's little sticky notes. They just operate as if they're um, post-it notes in the real world. So just grab one and write any of your contributions on that so we can capture it. The facilitator will just try to make sure everybody in the room gets a chance to share their experience. Um, so let me just have a quick look. It uh, looks to me like there's lots of little uh, cursors in that in the mirror. So um, if anybody does have problems accessing that, please do let us know. Um, so I think, um, Lynn, I think we're ready to be split into breakouts. Let's see if this works. You can always come back to the main breakout space and somebody will be here to help you. Um, any questions before we do that? Anybody at all? Everybody all right? Okay, I think we're okay. So Lynn, we're ready. Let's see, people are coming back slowly from the breakout rooms, making the most of those last precious sessions, seconds, I should say. Um, I personally have to say that was a really enriching experience hearing from a very broad range of um, experience. So where are we now? Lynn, are there still people coming back from the rooms? Yes, everybody should be back in about 10 seconds. Okay, great. I'll give it give it a little bit. You can see lots of activity still in the mirror board, um, which we're going to have the joyous experience of bringing together and making lots of sense of. <laughs> um, okay, I think everybody's back in the room almost. The number's ticking back up. Um, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that as much as um, I did and don't have as sore fingers as I do from uh, uh, capturing as much of that um, valuable experience as possible. Um, so I think we we will, we could share the, yes, Lynn, I think yeah, we might share the Miro board just so that people can see who, maybe some of you who were on the call weren't able to access the Miro, um, just so that you can see what that is, we might share that. And um, what we're gonna do now, just for the last sort of, we've got about 13 minutes left um, of your precious time. So we'll try and uh, wrap up in that. So um, I am going to feed back on the top priorities from um, the first breakout room, and then we'll go to each one. I'll just say breakout group two and whoever was the facilitator in that room, if you can unmute yourself and give us just the top three priorities and same for breakout room three, four, and I think we combined five into one of the others. Is that right? I don't think we have a five from today, but you can unmute and shout. Right. If, yeah, that's right. Okay. So I think from us in um, breakout room one, Really, I think 
there was generally no doubt of uh, the need to facilitate the use of, of pest house as much as possible, but people are still needing um, the fundamentals of where to start and whether that's actually um, a flow chart of um, the steps to be taken, recognising that many, many projects are different, but that the principles are still there. Now, I know there's lots of information available um, on the Passive House Trust website for that, but it's also understanding um, the tools to have to debate the issue of costs with contractors. I think that was something that um, came back a lot. And then just in terms of how to build things into ERs and ensuring that as the person driving the project, you've got the right people, which I think was mentioned by some of the panelists um, early on. If I'm really, really frank and honest at this moment, there was so much breadth in our working group that it's quite difficult to identify just simply three priorities because we had quite a ranged and broad discussion. So I think what we'll do anyway, everybody, is that we will feed back after this. I know that will come in closing sentiments, but we'll, we'll feed back once we have had time to digest some of this. So I'm going to ask the facilitator for breakout room two to unmute and give us, if you can, do a better job of your top three priorities. Please, um, please do. Uh, please do that. You've got two minutes. <laughs> OK, so um, from group two, our top three were uh, our priority was to um, look at the life cycle cost benefits and the business case for passive house so um, enabling people to be better informed for the why why we're doing passive house and maybe to be, be better armed for the glitches should costs come in you know above expectation so um, that was our uh, one of our priorities the second priority was to get under the skin and understanding of what are all the different procure routes procurement routes that people are taking um even maybe less traditional procurement routes particularly for the public sector so looking at construction management management um contracting so you know what experience have people had um is that are there new routes for delivery for passive house that perhaps we haven't looked at um much in the past and then the third priority is really a catch-all which is um you know, lobbying for passive house to be a default standard. So whilst, you know, we want all Section 106 affordable homes to be passive house, at the moment, there's just no mandatory mechanisms that are making that possible. Um, so can we not just save a lot of time and hassle and lobby the government to be a lot more robust in increasing um, the mandatory standards that are more aligned to passive house? So those were the top three. Brilliant and an excellent job of distilling what I can see was a lot of discussion in your group. Thank you very much, Emma. Breakout room three. Who was that? Hello, that's me. That was you. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I couldn't type and think and talk at the same time. So there is a lot less there, but I'm sure uh, the rest of my um, group will put more things in there or um, I'll type up some notes in a bit. Um, but uh, top three things we had a, a long discussion. A lot of our discussion was around the 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 moving from design and good um, uh, good information and good knowledge to delivery, and that ranged around um, the idea of uh, sites, uh, particular sites that were involved in the discussion, uh, uh, particular areas involved in the discussion had fairly complex sites, and so. Passive house is it it it, it 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 it's one thing uh, in amongst quite a lot of other things. So uh, the main uh, point that we were looking at was learning from others, and I think you know there was discussion about the um, the various things within the passive house trust that we're trying to do that, and also um, across um, local authorities, um, a, a wider than just uh, the. Um, sorry, surrounding local authorities and so on. There was talk about different uh, places within London and um, uh, good programmes and you know, places that found it trickier. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion about the idea of um, which contractors are doing the right thing and are, are moving towards having this expertise and which ones, uh, well, which ones weren't on that list? Sorry, we shouldn't be negative. Which ones were on the journey to get that, um, if you see what I mean? 
Um, and there was discussion about a framework or portal or perhaps more visibility of the contracting side um, in things around uh, your the passive house trust and the, the publications um, and uh, not just the design side, if that um, makes sense. And then we also talked about the commercial aspects and around the different reports that um, are available about the commercial aspects, but being more open about the commercial aspects on specific projects. Um, I think that's where we got to as our next steps. But obviously, there was quite a lot of problem, problems to start off with and various um, solutions um, that uh, we came up with, which aren't some, some of which aren't covered by this. But anyway, it's a really interesting discussion. If anyone in the group wants to add anything to it, then please do. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Yes, I think I would encourage that just immediately in the aftermath of today, if you've got like just two, three minutes to add in anything that you know, have a look at the board that you were involved in and just see if there's anything else to add, because I think oh. that's where the, the stuff is um, most fresh. So then just to break out group four, um, if we can hear back from you. Hello, that's me, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, hello. So, yeah, we had a very lively discussion, lots around um, cost and how the supply chain works. So our kind of top three priorities, we distilled down to the perception of the contractor's risk. So then sort of pricing in risk, which is potentially a bit unnecessary. And then also linked to that, but we ran out of space really to type it into our little box, was around QSEs as well, like, like potentially putting costs in the wrong place, maybe including too much for risk, just kind of adding on a, a passive house percentage effectively, not actually taking the time to really do the due diligence and understand the pricing um, that's actually appropriate to the project. On the one hand, but then also it was flagged that sometimes um, quantity surveyors are under accounting for the extra time that's required on a passive house project during the um, site quality side of things. So uh, a bit of a bit of qu um, qu uh, quantity surveyor um, upskilling required there. Then our second thing was around the supply chain. So that's issues. We've got the three C's here. So capability, capacity and continuity all being issues on the, the supply chain side. And obviously really important on a pacifiers project while it's still applicable to any project and um, because we're looking at eliminating the performance gap in a pacifiers project, our supply chain and the continuity of that supply chain is really important. And then our final priority was really around that learning journey. So some of the other groups have already talked about this, but it's, you know, this learning journey is re required for the kind of whole team involved in a project. So getting to grips with things like whole life costings and some myth busting is required. And I did link to the Passive House Trust Benefits Guide, which everybody can access through the Miro board. And that's a really good document to go to if you want to get more information on that kind of whole life costing approach and um, some of that myth busting stuff. And also in that, we do start to talk about things around the extra value that might be um, applicable to a Passive House project. And that might be through additional um, sales revenue, which is now getting picked up by people like Rick's and references to that are in that document. So do have a look at that. We also include information on some green financing, which can make passive house projects stack up. So it's um, worth having a look at what's already there, but it's really good to hear from the groups today just to understand what more we can do around that as well. So it was a really great discussion. It's given me loads of ideas for things that we need to be looking into at the trust. So thank you to, to group four. Well, thanks so much for that feedback. And I think that really does um, kind of cover um, an unintended, you know, you set these, you set these roundtables up as sort, sort of quite a clear idea of where it might go. And then inevitably, it's a very different thing in the moment. And there's been such a broad, um, yeah, I think, Sarah, similarly, I'm, I'm sort of going, oh, we're going there with that. And then we're into procurement and now we're into costs and we're into other things as well. So it's really, really, um, really great, really interesting. So, yes, I think um, we're just a note to say that the mirror board will be available for a short time after the event. In terms of next steps, I think we'll just take a, a short time internally to just digest that um, the information that was shared. But we have recorded the beginning session. So those presentations by um, our speakers and the Q&A session, obviously the breakout sessions aren't recorded, um, but we will make that information available to all of you. And we will consider, I'm just going to click open the chat because it was a question from Paul. 
I mean, if I, actually, if there are any just quick questions, please free, feel free to unmute and ask because there's a huge trail of chat in the in the meeting chat. So if there is any immediate questions, please do. Can I, can I ask you a question, Sarah? Yes, please do. Sorry. Um, John Bitland here. I, I just, um, from all the things you suggested, two, two options just immediately spring to mind. Um, and I'd be very interested in people, what people think. So there's lots of things we'll, we'll look at and take away and come back to. But if, if one of them that was that we could try and set up a procurement framework like Emma talked about in Exeter, that people could tap into and use and everything, it was a kind of a pre-prepared, pre-packaged procurement framework. If that's option one, then option two is a series of little get-togethers whereby we share information from people who've got similar kinds of projects to you and we can learn from each other. So one's a networking kind of thing and one's we actually try and create the package what route would people prefer us to go down? Is it a learning journey or is it a procurement framework? Any thoughts right now from anybody? Please type which option you would find useful in the chat. Okay, <laughs> both. <laughs> both, yeah, no, I, I kind of get that. Procurement framework, both, both. Or learning. Okay, so number one, you can quickly write one, for a procurement framework if you don't want to do lots of typing or two for the networking or both if you want to load us up <laughs> okay it came out really strongly this need to learn from each other and people who've done it and got similar size projects was um and a similar status in terms of ownership models and so on yeah that came out strongly in our group definitely networking first okay <laughs> Just thanks thanks everybody for saying both <laughs> <laughs> but i i wonder as well is there a, for me i think that was a really succinct um honing in john on potential next steps so at least having those two clear ones um it is really a great place for us to start um but it and, does and look like lots of people are saying both but the network and just to note that we already are starting work on the plans for that networking the next meetings of this group you know, we've, we've got plans for that throughout the year. We've picked some topics already. Cost was already on our list. Um, so we will come back to that. So we will come back to you with more information at those um, those things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're not helping us, audience. Both, 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 <laughs> both. both. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, that's brilliant. Okay. Um, I would like to just say a quick thank you to um, Emma Davies, Emma Osmondson, Matt Bridgestock, Jacob Wilson and everybody who also helped facilitate the rooms and who helped organize the background behind all of this. And thank you all of you for giving up your time. Again, our aim here is to, I mean, the big picture aim here really is we all want to do better, create better quality housing, reduce the performance gap, reduce our carbon demands. You know, there's a wild range of, of things that we're all trying to do here but the key point is that we're all trying to do this collectively and in the most open knowledge share way that we can so really appreciate your contributions and um, lots of links there available actually the more time I spend on the Pacifest Trust website the more information I get and the more questions I can answer for myself there so please make use of everything that's there as well um there's lots of links um that Chaley is dropping in the chat about becoming a Passive House Trust member and signing up for our newsletter as well so we can make sure that all this information is out there and sort of build this community of people learning from each other and trying to deliver better outcomes for everybody. So thank you all so much and um, yeah, we look forward to, to the next one. <laughs> I'm just going to comment on this actually. I feel like I'm learning already learning from the Passive House Trust events faster than my actual capacity to absorb the information. I feel that on a daily basis, um, but that's great, isn't it? It just shows the wealth of information that's here and people willing to share it. So thanks again, everybody, and we shall see you again soon, I hope. Thanks very much. <laughs>